Good afternoon. Welcome to another episode of Logan's Devotions. It's great to be together. Wonderful to be able to open up God's Word for another day and see what He has to say. We're turning through to Romans chapter 8 again, but before I read our passage, let's pray. Father in heaven, we come before you again with hearts that desire to know you more and love you more and to serve you faithfully. And yet we recognize that we can do none of those things unless you help us. We're utterly dependent upon you for everything. And so as we turn to your word now, we do pray that your Holy Spirit would take it and press it into our hearts. Help us. Help us today. Would you take this word and press it into the hearts of every hearer, every viewer, and into my own heart as well. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Romans chapter 8, verse 28 and 29. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined, to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. <clears throat> well, Romans 8.28 is another one of those glorious, what I love to call, fridge magnet texts. You probably know what I mean by that, but I call a fridge magnet text one of those texts which you happen to see on people's fridges all the time. There's little magnets of them. There's little pictures. They're the ones that get quoted all the time. So you think of things like Jeremiah. I think it's 29.29 where it says, I know the plans I have for you. Plans to cause you to prosper. And they're these verses which get quoted everywhere and almost always used out of context and very frequently used wrongly. Fridge magnet texts. And Romans 8 verse 28 is probably one of the most common of all of them. In fact, it's probably the verse that gets quoted more than any other verse. In almost every situation you're in, especially negative situations, someone quotes Romans 8 verse 28. And there's a reason for that. Because it is one of the most precious texts to all of us. However, we need to ask the question, what is God really saying in Romans 8 verse 28? What is God trying to tell us? Well, I shouldn't say trying because he's doing it. What is God telling us in Romans 8 verse 28? It's very important that we understand it properly so that we use it and speak about it in the way that God intends. Firstly, Notice who this great promise and verse is for. In 8 verse 28, Paul says, We know that for whom? For those who love God. And then just a bit further down, he says, For those who are called according to his purpose. And then again, For those himhof, for those." whom he foreknew. And in verse 30, those whom he predestined. Who is he speaking about? Is he speaking about everyone? Because I've heard people use Romans 8 verse 28 for unbelievers. And and I've heard people say to unbelievers, God works together everything for your good. But is this a promise that an unbeliever can claim? And we have to say no. This is a promise for those who love God. This is a promise for those, for those whom God is called, has called according to his purpose, purposes. This is a promise for those whom God foreknew. This is a promise for those whom he predestined. We see all of those, don't we, in 28, 29 and 30. So this is a promise, to say it a different way, to use the language of Paul from earlier chapters, this is a promise for those whom are in Christ. For those who are united to Christ. You see, 
if we separate union with Christ and this verse, we gut it of its intention. But when we leave it rooted in Jesus, in his work, in the work of the Trinity towards those whom God is saving, then we get to see what it's truly all about. So to say it a different way, Romans 8 verse 28 and following is a promise for all of God's children. We've seen, haven't we, that that God has united people in, in Christ and therefore in that union with Christ we are received as adopted sons and daughters. And so it's to them that this promise comes. And so notice then in the context of believers, the promise being given to you if you're a believer in Christ, if you're not, then this promise is no hope to you. But if you are, notice what God is promising. Verse 28, we know that for those whom those who love God, all things work together for good. So what's God promising in Romans 8 verse 28? Everything works together for good. Okay, what's everything? I know it's pretty straightforward, but it means every single thing. All things. Does that mean an abusive parent? Yes. Does that mean cancer? Yes. Does that mean being born into a wealthy family? Yes. Does that mean a divorce? Yes. Now, notice that he doesn't say he he turns some things for good, but rather we should understand it in the way that Joseph understood what happened to him in the Old Testament. Do you remember the words that Joseph says? Joseph says to his brothers, you meant it, speaking of his being sold into slavery, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. Now, notice the repetition. It's the same word. You meant it for evil, and it doesn't say, but God turned it into good, but God meant it for good. In other words, Joseph's being sold into slavery was not outside of God's plan, and he recovered it and turned it into good. Sometimes people talk about God's sovereignty like that, as if God... God responds to the evil actions that people do and ensures that they work out for good in the end. That's not the way Joseph understood and it's not the way Paul understands it. But rather, God is meaning it for good. He's working everything towards your good. Now, this means that as you look back in your life at all the different events, though they pain you and though Evil pains God, yet we can say that they are part of God's sovereign plan to bring about his purposes. So what are his purposes? What is God working together for our good? What is the good, I should say, that God is working towards? Well, let's have a look at the verse 28. God for those, sorry, for those who love God, all things work together for good. Okay, so what's the good? For those who are called according to his purpose. And then in verse 29, we get to see what the good is. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined, here's the good, to be conformed to the image of his son. And here's the reason why. In order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. So what is the good? God is working. Is it your health, wealth, and prosperity? No. Otherwise, the vast majority of believers in previous centuries would not come under this banner. When you consider, when you consider the French believers who were strapped to cannons and whipped and had salt rubbed into their wounds, was that 
for their good? Well, if you ask many 21st century Christians, they'd say no. Yet according to Paul and according to Joseph and according to God, it was. Why? Because the good that is being worked is our being conformed to the image of Christ. In other words, God is working together absolutely everything in your life from beginning to end to make you just like Jesus Christ so that you would be a brother or sister just like Jesus. He is conforming you. He's making you after the same pattern of. So you uh, think of those big manufacturing facilities where they produce just hundreds and thousands of the same thing. Think of maybe a peg factory. They have a mold. They pour the plastic in. It has the little steel clip that makes it that snippy little peg and out produces millions of pegs, all identical, maybe with different colors, but all identical. Well, Christ is the mold. He is the perfect mold. And Jesus, sorry, God is pressing you and I into that mold. And sometimes that hurts. Sometimes it hurts as we get pressed into that mold. And, so, and, and out pops one thing and out pops another thing. But he is pressing us into that mold in order to make us like Jesus Christ. And why is he doing it? He's doing it, as I said, in order that he, Jesus, might be the firstborn among many brothers. You see, your being conformed to Christ is not the end goal. The end goal is not that you would stand up at the end of days and say, wow, look at me. I am just like Jesus. No, no, the end goal of God through every moment of your suffering, through every moment of your joy, through every moment of your sickness and every moment of your health, through every moment of your poorness and every moment of your richness, through every marital difficulty and every marital bliss, from the death of your child to their graduation at college, every single second of it is coming together so that Christ, Jesus Christ, would be preeminent. He would be the firstborn the greatest, so that in the coming ages, when all of the sons and daughters of God are gathered together, and they're shining in the radiant splendor of God, perfectly sanctified, perfectly glorified, in that moment, Christ would shine the brightest. So that as we see one another in splendor, dressed perfectly, we would see the radiance of Christ all the brighter. That's the goal of God. And that's what he's working in your life, everything towards. And I tell you, when that becomes the lens with which you view everything in your life, everything becomes bearable. But not just bearable, like grinning and bearing through it, but it becomes something worth exalting in. Or, as Paul would say somewhere else, boasting in. He boasts, Paul says, I boast in my suffering. Or you can think of the disciples rejoicing, for they were counted worthy to suffer for the sake of Christ. Yet look at us. We shy from pain. We shy from suffering. We flee from opposition. We, we worship and bow down before the God of comfort and ease because we don't truly understand what God is doing. Let me encourage you, exhort you to take up the lens of the exaltation of Christ. You see, he was made low, suffered and died so that you might become conformed to him so that he would be the chief brother among many. Let's pray. Father in heaven, 
We thank you for this glorious plan that you are working together so that your son would be exalted. Would you do that in our life? Thank you for this glorious lens, this glorious interpretation of all things in our life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, thanks so much for joining me for another devotion. I'll see you back here for number 300. God bless.